Oh, Father, I just I feel like we've almost had the sermon already. To know that the blood of Jesus covers every sin. To know that because of the blood of Jesus, we are righteous and holy and pure and acceptable in your sight. In the blood of Jesus, we're chosen. Through the blood of Jesus, we're family. Through the blood of Jesus, we're free and forgiven. Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus to change our world and to change us. Uh, Lord, take control right now. This is, this is all about you. As Paul points out, we exist, we are here for the praise of your glorious grace. We exist for your glory. I don't, uh, I don't want the glory, Father. I, I want it all to be about you. I know I'm nothing without you and apart from you. Uh, Lord, thank you for being here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Game changers. Victor was a loser. He felt like a loser. He struggled so hard in school that at 16, the school counselor called him to his office and said, well, I just want to tell you, you ought to drop out of school right now because you're never going to succeed. And you need to go to work. And it's what Victor did. He tried and failed at 75 different jobs. But the 76th one made a difference. The 76th one required an intelligence IQ test. And so Victor took the test. Now, in an IQ test, IQ test 100 is normal. If you're lucky, you make 100. I'm not sure I'm there. I'm not taking the test to find out. Nobody would say I'm normal anyway. Victor's test came back with a score of 161. Uh, that makes him a genius. And that changed his life. Never in his life had he thought of himself in that way. And now he changed. Victor Serienko went on to become a pioneer in the field of laser surgery. Victor Serienko became the president of a group called Minsa. That's an exclusive club for geniuses. His life was changed in one moment. That's what we're talking about when we come to Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 1. A life-changing moment. Jesus the game changer. And I got, we were headed down to Eugene yesterday to watch the football, and I did one of these things. I said, I should have found some people to get up here and talk about the game changer. That's me, a day late and a dollar short all the way around. But every one of us sitting in this room could tell a story. How one day we were losers, and the next day because of Jesus... We became winners. That's what Paul's talking about. If you, and last week, that's what Paul's talking about here. And last week, we, we got into that. And, and, and verses one through, or 3 through 7, Paul talks about who we are in Jesus. Because we come into relationship with Jesus, he said there are three things that are true that we looked at last week. He says, number one, it means that you are chosen. That God looked down and said, I want you. In relationship with me. I, even if you're the only one, I would choose you and send my son to die for you. That was, a, that was moving for me. Because of Jesus, I am part of God's family. I've been adopted. I am his son. And, and we talked about adoption and what that means and how we need to live as adopted sons and daughters. And we talked about the freedom Jesus broke the chains of sin that bound us and took away the 
condemnation and the, of sin and our guilt that we carry with us. And, and we had a, several different images that we used on that. That's who we are in Jesus. And, and the impetus behind all this is that I want us to be motivated to live like who we are. Today, we're going to pick up with verse 7, go down through 14, and we're going to look at four more things. These are not who we are, but they are what we have in Jesus. And and I want to begin, I want to just read verses, the last half of 7, he talks about our freedom and forgiveness, and then into verse verse 7, he says, well, I'm going to read the whole verse, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, and here's the phrase I want us to focus on in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding. We have, because of Jesus, the riches of God's grace. Now, the important word he starts out in accordance with, according to, that's in keeping with. Let me, let me pose a, an option for you. Now, suppose today I walked up and handed you a $10 bill. Not going to happen, but suppose I did. How would you feel about that? Feel like I was a cheapskate? What would happen if Bill Gates came in here and handed you a 10 buck bill? How would you feel about that? Cheapskate. What's the difference? In accordance with ability. It has a, it focuses on our ability to give. And so we, Paul, the very first thing, we have been set free and we have been forgiven in accordance with God's riches. I, I want to give you a little bit of a physical uh, image to take with you. Uh, I, I want to, I brought this picture. I, I want you to think about this as your life. A- and I want you to think about God's grace. So you want to go, I want you to think about the water tower up on the hill. It's full of water. I mean, we could, we could run the water if we were the only ones. And God, that represents God's grace. And he pours it into our lives. And he pours it and pours it and pours it up to the top. Stop. And he fills us with grace. Now, is that where God stops? He says he lavished it. Hit it, brother. Lavish it. Lavish it. It runs, and it runs, and it runs and never stops. You can turn it off a moment. That's the grace that no matter how... Paul put it in Romans 5, he says, When sin abounds, grace abounds to cover the sin. It is sufficient for our need. Now, how do we live? If we have the riches of God's grace, how should we live? Well, you know, sometimes we get to thinking... You know, that's, that's all I get. So if I'm going to give grace to somebody, I'm going I'm to make sure I preserve some for me. And you know what? We can limit the amount of grace God gives in our life. Because he'll never give us more than we can hold. So if we focus on keeping our pitcher full and saving it, God says, okay. But when we start giving it out, what happens? We constantly have a flow. If we're living like children of God's grace who have the riches of his grace, we have the ability to give to others. We have the responsibility to give to others over and over and over. That's lavishing. There's no limit to it. There's no. It, it's like Bill Gates coming up to you and handing you a debit card and saying... Man, you have a million dollars on that card. Is that going to change your life? Now suppose he says, oh, by the way, when you spend money, there's going to be a constant supply, so you'll always have a million dollars. Is that going to change your life? 
That's exactly what God has done with us. My grace is sufficient. I forgive you, and I'm pouring it in here, and I'm giving you grace, and I want you to share it with other people. And by the way, it never diminishes. We are rich people in the grace of Jesus. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, talks to the rich. And, and I want you to work with me a little bit here. He talks to the rich. And we think of rich people, we think of people who have uh, lots of money, right? I want you to transform that thought for a moment in thinking about the riches of God's grace. Who has the riches of God's grace? We do. You believe that? Do you believe it? Yes. Well, we're rich. Listen to these words, thinking of terms of grace. Chapter 6 of First Timothy, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world. Command those who are rich in grace in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, which richly provides everything for our enjoyment, to command them to do good and be rich in good deeds and to be generous. But what's he telling us to do there? Pour ourselves out, give it away. In this way, and be willing to share, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves and as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We have the riches of God's grace. It's like having a bank account that never runs dry. How many like to have a bank account like that? Baby, bring it on. I can never exhaust God's grace in my life. I, I, can be, I can fall off the bridge so far that it's never beyond God's reach to bring me back. He has the grace and sufficiency through the blood of Jesus to keep me filled. And my responsibility, when I have the riches of God's grace, I have the ability to extend grace to other people. What does that look like? It looks like no rage. It looks like no anger when somebody lets me down. It looks like forgiveness and picking them up and starting over again without any cost. What doesn't it look like? Well, Paul talks about that. Let us sin that grace may abound. Woohoo! No way. We have the riches of God's grace. He lavished. I, I love that word lavished. Just think about, what. there's no measurement. There, there's no, uh, you earned this today. It's just pouring, 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 and flowing and overflowing in my life. God opened up the windows and the doors and dumped. He poured it. It flows constantly in us, over us, through us, around us, and it ought to be flowing out to our community. And we need to live like rich people. Next thing he gave us is knowledge. I got a picture here I want you to look at. Who can tell me what the picture is? And you can tell me and you could be right. I don't know. But what's the problem? Why can't you tell what the picture is? It's all put. To, it's not put together. They're individual pieces. They're just kind of a chaos. You know, jigsaw puzzles I don't like anyway. And, and, and usually I have a pattern to work from and say, well, that, that's what this is going to look like. This doesn't have that. That's kind of the idea that Paul is putting out there in Jesus. You see, Jesus revealed the mystery. The mystery is a puzzle. The mystery is, is that thing that God's been up to throughout eternity that people were trying to figure out. You could look at that and say, that, that's the Old Testament. 
You look at the prophecies of the Old Testament. You know, maybe Isaiah gave you a couple pieces here, and Micah gave you a piece here, and, and maybe back in Genesis, God gave you a piece here. And everybody looks at their piece, and they say, and a lot of people come up with their own ideas. That's why that was the problem with the Jews. They came up with their own idea based on the pieces they had and said, this is what the Messiah is going to be, and they got the picture all wrong. In Jesus, the chaos of God's mystery, those little bits and pieces, those clues, Jesus brought them all together. In Jesus, the mystery is made known. We have been, we have been given knowledge about what God's up to and where it's all headed. How many would play a game knowing that they couldn't lose? And, and if things didn't work quite right in that process, would you be stressed? Why? Because I know how it's going to turn out. You know, I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, but I know I can't lose, so I'll just keep playing. That's us. Joyce says the word he uses is actually a, a bookkeeper's term. It all adds up. Somehow, have you ever been in life and you've looked at something and said, that just doesn't make sense? Maybe it's been your own life. Maybe it's your own life. You've kind of been going through your life. It's chaotic. It's in pieces. It's shards. Things are happening here and there. And you just can't put it together. Jesus brings it together. It's Jesus is that missing piece that makes sense out of things. And we look and we live in Jesus. And now we go, aha. It's something the prophets didn't have. You look at Peter. Peter said the prophets were telling about the salvation to come. They didn't know it all. And the angels are longing to look into it, to understand it. We have the knowledge that he's bringing everything back together again. The thing that sin blew up, all of creation, this thing that sin that blew up, your life, somehow Jesus is the one who's going to bring it all back together again. And we know it. How many of you have read the end of the book? What's the end of the book say? We win. That's the end of the story. So how should we live? Winners. Absolute confidence. You can do what you want. You can bring into my life whatever you want. But I know I win. That makes all the difference in the world. So why should we be running around, bouncing off walls, pulling our hair out when things aren't working out right and wondering how it's going to all pan out? And that's my theology for the end. Of the, it's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> pan millennialism. It all pans out. It works. You see, when you come to Jesus, did anybody have a life that was kind of messed up and, and out of sorts and just kind of had a bunch of pieces? And when you came to Jesus, suddenly it came into view and you found it. It all makes sense now. You know anybody that's trying to make sense out of life? You have the opportunity to go and tell them, I've got the answer. Jesus, can, Jesus will help you make sense out of it all. When times will reach, it's all according to God's timing. That, that's the rub in this thing. Because I know how it's going to work out. I just don't know when it's going to work out. But on that day when the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back, it all comes together. This is the one I love. We have good news. Anybody watch the news lately? You know what? Dolores and I hardly ever turn on the news. Because I like to go to bed at night feeling good. And I like to go to work in the morning not depressed because of all the things that have happened and are happening in the world. How many of you like getting good news? How does good news make you feel? When, what's the last piece of good news you got? Your friend had a baby. Party time. 
Even if it is in Wilhelmina. Yeah. Woohoo! You got your driver's license. That makes us all afraid. But he's smiling and happy. Good news. I mean, there's nothing like good news. Do you, you think we live in a world that would love to hear some good news? I mean, pick up the headlines. War in Syria. People killed in Afghanistan. Employment, unemployment up. Suicide, rape, murder. Those are the headlines. We have good news. Look at verses 11 through 13. In him we were also chosen. And, and I want you, that, that word chosen here is a little bit different than what we looked at last week. It, it talks about us being his select portion. God chose us as his part of the inheritance. We are, we're the one he looked down and said, yep, I want him. If you think about an inheritance, if you know, we went through our living trust lately and we told our kids, if there's anything of ours you want, let us know. Found out nobody wants anything we have, but, well, they want my guns. That, that God had the choice of what he wanted from this earth. It wasn't the trees, it wasn't the animals, sorry environmentalists. It wasn't the mountains, it was us. He chose us. That's what I want out of all this. That's that's kind of good news, isn't it? Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. You remember, you remember Luke chapter 2? The shepherds out on the hill are kind of trying to keep warm, trying to ignore the sheep that are bleeding over there. And, and suddenly the heavens blazed and the angels came down. What was the message that the angels had? Behold, we bring you great tidings of good news. A Savior has been born. That's our news. We have news to tell our world. We have a Savior that has been born. And our connection with the community is to go out into the streets and into our neighborhoods and tell people good news. Is, is there anybody here who doesn't tell anybody good news when they get it? Well, I just scored a million dollars, but I'm not going to tell anybody. You tell people good news, don't you? I had a guy call me at 2.30 in the morning to let me know his baby was born. He was excited. Me, not so much. I said, Bob, you could have called at 9 tomorrow. It would have just been as exciting for then as it is now. But we tell people good news. How does that tell us we ought to be living? How many of you have told the good news to somebody lately? Don't you raise your hands. Well, I don't know anybody. You don't know anybody? How many of you live in a neighborhood? How many of you go to work every day? How many eat out? There's somebody. You don't have to sit down and tell them the whole story. But you can communicate with your face and by your life that you have something going on that they don't have. And guess what? I see people smiling and laughing. I want to know why. When Fred's smiling and laughing, I know it's not a good thing. Grinning like the Cheshire cat, like the cat that ate the bird. 
what a difference we could make if we just smiled and went through lines and said, man, I hope you're having a great day. So I blew it yesterday because we went through Dutch Brothers on the way home from the football game, our grandson's football game, and, and we pulled up and, and my hearing's bad. That's why I didn't respond. That's why I, she looked out and she said, I thought she said, you got anything to say? Dolores hit me because I said, no. Because she asked the question, are you having a good day? <laughs> yeah. I said, no, no. So then I, when she told me that, I said, yeah, it's kind of a bad day. Our grandson lost his football game. I said, but, but um, she's on top of that good day? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We can make a difference. Man, good news. Uh, that kind of goes with what Jesus said. Uh, go into all the world. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach and observe all that you've commanded. I've commanded you. That's kind of the heart of sharing good news. I have good news. I never have to bring anybody down because I have been bad news. I have good news. Then we have the Holy Spirit. Look, 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance of the redemption of those who are God's possession in the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit... That is God's promise. Jesus told his disciples on the night he was betrayed, you know, I know it's depressing, I know it's sad news, but he says, it, it's for your good that I'm leaving because I'm going to send a comforter. I'm going to send someone who's going to be with you and walk with you and live in you, and you're going to have a companion to live in you. And Acts 2.38, what happened? Peter stands up and says, repent and be baptized, each one of you, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, who will indwell you, live with you, guide you, convict you, teach you. You'll not be alone. And the first thing he says, it, Paul uses to describe it, is a mark or a seal. Now, there's three aspects to that. I, wanna, I want you to think about it. The first one is a mark of ownership. Romans 8 it says the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. But it's a mark of ownership. I borrowed this from Roy. Anybody know what it is? A brand. What's a brand do? Marks ownership. And so the Holy Spirit is a mark in our lives that declares ownership. Now, he doesn't take a hammer and smack in the eyes with it, but he's there. That mark, what's that mark look like? Read Galatians 5. Uh, it, it's a life lived differently. We no longer live according to the flesh. We no longer live for ourselves. We live by the Spirit who, who empowers us to live a life of glory to God. We live a life that is filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and self-control. Against these such things there is no law. So how do you know you have the Holy Spirit in you? Oh, come on. When you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, those things. When those things are in your life, I know God owns me. I know I am His. So it's a mark of ownership. You have the brand. I lost my, oh, there it is. But it's also security. We don't use seals much anymore. But when in Paul's day, when you sent out a, an official document, the king would take his seal and put wax on it and plant his seal and send it out. And it would go to the pe person to whom it was intended. And when they got it, they could look at the seal. If it was still intact, we know no one looked at it. It was secure. We use seals like that today, don't we? We put padlocks on doors. 
secure. It is my security. I know that I'm secure with God in my relationship. It's a badge of authority. I work for a, a cleaning company that kill, or killed, yeah, that cleaned the Peace Health buildings in Springfield. But there were a lot of secure areas that people couldn't go into. But guess what? Because I was in charge of the cleaning crew, I got a badge. And that badge had a magnetic code on it. And I could walk up to a reader and I could sweep that. And I gained entrance. Anywhere in the building. I had privileges other people didn't have. They trusted me. Imagine that. That's the Holy Spirit in our life. I have authority. And that authority is I can come into the very presence of God at any time, at any moment, with confidence, knowing that He's going to accept me and hear me. I have authority to claim the promises of God. I have access to God because the Holy Spirit's in my life. I have that mark. We live in a world that doesn't have that. You have something nobody else has. It's always a good feeling. I always loved it when I had something my sister didn't have. Of course, I was pretty nasty about it, but I hope we're not. We, they can have it too. That's the good news. But it's also a deposit. Uh, literally, a down payment. Anybody here ever made a down payment? I've never had the money to go buy a car or cash out. So I always sign a contract. Then they say, after you sign the contract, yeah, we need a check for X number of dollars. Why? Because we'd like to make sure you're going to finish out the contract. What happens if that deposit, if I don't fulfill the contract? They'll give it back to me, right? The Holy Spirit is God's deposit. He's our down payment that God in giving him says, I'm going to do everything I say I will do and you can count on it because I'm giving you the Holy Spirit and he said, it's a deposit or a down payment. If I don't fulfill it, I lose it. Now that's a difficult concept. But the only way the Spirit comes in our lives as a down payment is knowing the faithfulness of God that he's not going to fail. He's my guarantee. When I have that seal in my life, when I know I have absolute confidence, I am so weary of talking to Christians and saying, are you saved? And hearing them say, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. You can know. Because you have the Spirit in your life, I am absolutely 100% sure I am saved. First John 5, so these are written that you might know that you are saved. What do we have in Jesus? Because of Jesus, I have everything. I want to close with this story. Uh, it's about uh, Stanley Livingston. Stanley Livingston, was, as most of you know, was a, was a missionary to Africa. He had a health condition that required him to drink only goat's milk. And wherever he went, he had a goat. And he came to a village and set up his, his residence in that village and had his goat outside his uh, house and, and, or hut, and he milked it and drank the milk every day. And one day the chief of that village came to him and was visiting with him and started looking at his goat. And the chief made it clear he wanted the goat. And so Stanley Livingston made the deal. The chief took the goat and handed him a stick. The goat went away and Stanley Livingston sat in his hut saying, What did I just do? Why would I give up my goat for a stick? Friend came that day. And Stanley Livingston went on, I gave up my, I don't know what I was thinking, I gave up my goat, this guy handed me a stick. What am I going to do now? And his friend said, Stanley, that is no stick. 
That is a scepter. You lost your goat. But now you own every goat in the village. Start living like the king you are. Do I need to make the application? Some of us sit around whining and complaining and belly aching about all that we've lost because of, re- of Jesus. And all we got back was a stick. It's no stick. It's a scepter. You haven't lost anything. You have gained everything. Are we living like that? Are we living like the people we are? Some of you are sitting here holding on to the goat. I love my goat. My goat's my security. My goat is what life is all about. And God is saying, you know, I'll trade you. I'll give you my stick if you'll give me your goat. See, that goat is up here. That goat is all the things this world has to offer me and the things that I have, and, and I don't want to let go of it because of my security. And God says, if you'll let go of the goat, I'll give you the world. And so today is an opportunity to let go of the goat. And claim the world. To give up being a slave to sin and becoming a son of God. To give up wearing the chains and the manacles and walk in freedom and forgiveness. To step into the realm of the chosen today. Today's an opportunity to become a king or a prince and gain possession of everything God has. Think that will make a difference the way we live? All we have to do is believe it. Father, thank you. Thank you for being an amazing God, a generous God, an open-handed God that that doesn't measure out your goodness to us, but you pour it on us. Thank you for coming and offering us your scepter for the goat. Thank you for all we have. Lord, help us to take the blinders off and recognize who we are. Help us to recognize what we have. Let us begin living like the people we are in Jesus. And Lord, help us to leave this place determined to let people know who don't know Jesus that they can have everything we have because of Jesus. Lord, today maybe there's someone who needs to make a trade and step into the glorious freedom that you offer through Christ. Lord, would, would you help us to listen? Spirit, would you be insistent? Would you make it clear to us how much more is available to us if we just let go of what we're holding on to? Spirit, help us to feel the power that comes with being a son of God. That comes from being free. That comes from being forgiven. Lord, speak to us. Spirit, draw us by your power. Lift up Jesus that we might be drawn to him today. It's in his name we pray. Amen.